As we look ahead to the 2023 session, Democratic lawmakers have said they'd like to address our state's problems with alcohol through new legislation. Now, in August, New Mexico In-Depth put New Mexico's nation-leading alcohol-related death rate into the spotlight. If you haven't read it already, they've published an extensive seven-part series called Blind Drunk. Journalist Ted Alcorn focuses on the issue itself, drunk driving, alcohol's impact on violent crime, myths when it comes to who carries the burden of this problem, failings in our state's public policy, and the overarching issue of addiction and how it's treated. We brought in Mr. Alcorn and a panel of experts to talk through the various factors. Now, in this excerpt from that roundtable uh, conversation, we explain the scope of the problem and potential solutions, including possible policy changes from the legislature as early as next year. Hello everyone, we're joined by Ted Alcorn today. He's a writer and an independent journalist who did a great deal of work on this project. We also have Dr. Camilla Venner. She's an associate professor of clinical psychology at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Jenny Wei, an internal medicine physician at Gallup Indian Medical Center and state representative Joanne Ferrari for Doña Ana County. Thank you all for joining us for this important discussion. We wanna follow this very closely here at New Mexico PBS and we thank you for your time today. Ted, let me start with you, of course. You wrote an article, wrote this, each article in a seven part series in case folks have not seen this yet on alcohol use and misuse here in New Mexico. Can you start by explaining how this project came about and what did you think this, why did you think this uh, issue deserved this kind of coverage? Well, about a year ago, New Mexico and Depth asked me to look into a story on alcohol. They had some suspicions that the mortality we were seeing for COVID was connected to alcohol use in the state. Mm -hmm. But it didn't take long for me to notice uh, some of the, the basic factors that make alcohol really stand out. New Mexico has uh, not only the highest rate of alcohol-related deaths in the country, we have the highest rate head and shoulders over every other state. And the more I learned, the more I felt like uh, this sort of catastrophe that was happening in plain sight was the result of a lot of misconceptions that we have about how alcohol affects our population, what we can do about it. Mm -hmm. And so as, as the reporting went on, I spoke to more and more people and collected data. It, it felt like uh, it needed a lot of space to grow. Um, so in the end, as you said, it became a seven part series and I, I interviewed over 150 people for it. And, um, you know, I think we came to some conclusions uh, that surprised even me. Mm -hmm. One of those conclusions, by the way, in the, the first in the series is brilliantly titled An Emergency Hiding in Plain Sight. Very apt title there. Kind of sets the stage with this issue and we're facing in New Mexico. Let me ask you this, through your research, you found drinking kills New Mexicans at a much higher rate than anywhere else in the country. The conclusion reaches that we failed to address this crisis in part because we've misunderstood it. What, what's been the big misunderstanding in your research? Well, there's been a few misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. I think the first one um, growing up in Albuquerque in the 1990s was that I was you know, both aware of the tremendous problem of DWI in our state, but also um, buffeted by the policy prescriptions that we were starting to put in place because at that point our state really made a collective and systematic and sustained effort to reduce dwi and i think that 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 has had numerous benefits uh, we brought down the rates of uh, crash fatalities uh, a lot mm -hmm. but we kind of missed the forest for the trees because when you look at alcohol related deaths nowadays dwis only account for about one in ten of them so nine in 10 at alcohol related deaths in the state are, are occurring mm -hmm. elsewhere. We overlook the role that alcohol plays in violence. Uh, as it turns out, you know, we have of course, widespread shared concerns about having a safer state. Our le elected officials are talking about it. What they don't often say is that 40% of people who died by homicide in the state died with alcohol in their blood, mm -hmm. as, as did 30% of people who died by suicide. So, so alcohol is the most common intoxicant <laughs> In violence in New Mexico. Mm. Those are the kind of the kind of blind spots I think that have kept us from addressing this issue head on. Good points there. I want to bring in Dr. Jenny Wei on this issue. Um, doctor, how should we approach this clearly life-threatening, uh, you know, issue? And what do we need to do to get a better understanding as New Mexicans about the depth of the problem? 
a lot of people who struggle with alcohol use disorders also have comorbid mental health disorders. And it's important to treat all of those. Right. Um, and it's important to treat, you know, I think what we say a lot in addiction medicine is that every door is the right door, whether it's through my primary care clinic, whether it's through when they get admitted to the hospital in the intensive care unit after a motor vehicle accident or broken bones, or whether it's through the emergency department, we need to make sure that in every possible door that people are entering, that there are treatment options available, that we offer them in the emergency department when they're admitted to the hospital here and when I see them in the primary care setting. I think too often as a as primary care doctors, we feel we, we treat the 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 complications of alcohol use disorders, like liver disease, um, like the broken bone that happened, at, uh, or you know the motor vehicle accident um, mm -hmm. injuries, mm -hmm. but we don't really under treat the underlying cause of all of these problems in the first place, which of course is their alcohol use disorder. And given the extent of the problem, we cannot just put that on behavioral health specialists, psychiatrists. We as primary care providers need to be taking ownership of this as well, given how severely under-resourced our behavioral health departments are in in the state. And so I very much believe that uh, as a general internal medicine provider, family medicine provider, general surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, all of us need to be able to treat alcohol use disorders and not just uh, rely on the non-existent uh, behavioral health department that may not be able to get an appointment for many, many months. Mm. If, I, if I may, I just wanted mm -hmm. to put that in context too, because the, the state has looked at the scale of untreated substance use in the state. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk, of course, a lot about the state's struggles with opiates, fentanyl, methamphetamines, but alcohol is the biggest untreated substance use problem in New Mexico. There are 73,000 people who are estimated to have an alcohol disorder who aren't getting treated. And that's more than people with disorders of, for all other substances combined. So it shows that there's a big opportunity for the for the care that Dr. Ways mentioned. Reading the series, it really struck me how screening by docs could be so impactful here. It, it, it just it, why, why is this not really kind of taking root just a little bit with a little bit more vigor inside medical circles? I'm curious your opinion on that. Well, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a clinical psychologist, but mm -hmm. what my understanding, uh, doctors have a lot to do in their 12 minutes or 15 minutes that they have Fair with enough. patients. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be, um, you know, a, an issue of time. There's also an issue of um, training, not a lot of training in medical school and residencies focus on addiction for as much as it shows up in clinics, they don't get that much training. Um, so I think there can be a self-efficacy piece where they're not really entirely sure um, what to do if, they, if the patient does screen positive in a slight brief intervention in a compassionate way um, to talk about, you know, um, what are they thinking? Here's a, you know, what we're seeing. What do you think about that? And having a nice conversation and having an open door, like Jenny Way says, um, every door is right. Um, so I think there's a lot more we can do for training mm -hmm. medical students and um, helping um, doctors feel, you know, more self-efficacy like Dr. Way feels. So I'd just like to add that, you know, back in the 90s when we passed the major legislation to, you know, combat uh, DWI, um, we did consider the behavioral health problems of it too. Um, but uh, didn't really reach as far as we um, wanted to. Um, but something that came out from them was to somehow incentivize um, doctors uh, by every time that they uh, do the uh, SAMHSA uh, screening and make it so that, you know, we can incentivize them to go ahead and do that and help their patients. Interesting. Um, Representative, let me stay with you on this. I mean, obviously we had a the awful news with the parade and gallop with the injuries suffered by somebody who appeared to be in, impaired behind the wheel and just an awful situation when the law enforcement approached the vehicle it just took off. Does it make it harder when we have situations like that to, or does it actually help move things along in a certain way? How, how do you see that as a rep, as an elected representative? Well, um, I know that um, Ted has been working on this series for a long time, since probably the beginning of the year at least. Mm -hmm. um, and like in the 90s, when we were starting to look at um, the overall package of you know DWI uh, changes that we needed, um, the Cravens crash yes. um, tragedy happened. And um, 
just as we were getting ready to go to the legislature, uh, Nadine Milford and her husband Bob became advocates for the change that we needed. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope it brings the attention that we need to motivate um, the what we you know should start like the governor immediately setting up a task force with legislators and uh, and all of the experts such as Dr. Wei and Miss um, um, Bummer <laughs> and um, we need to make sure that we use scientific evidence based uh, approaches again to revitalize the not just DWI the enforcement and helping the victims and the and preventing the consequences but overall for alcohol related deaths and this is really important um, because i think as ted pointed out that um, adverse childhood experiences are uh, usually related to someone in the family for domestic violence for right. child and right. neglect and abuse um, all of these different things seem to coalesce around the um, alcohol abuse, and uh, we need to hit, uh, you know, hit it head on. Ted, I want to ask you about something that I think a lot of folks would find very interesting outside of political circles, and that is taxing alcohol and what it does to lessen the amount of drinking going on out there. If you would, in general terms, sort of lay out the framework of what that is and what you uh, discovered in your research as well. Well, historically, I think the public and lawmakers have often tended to think of alcohol taxes as a revenue raiser. Mm -hmm. We, in, in our state and in many other states, we impose a very small excise tax on alcohol. And when you break it down to, to the amount per standard drink, we're talking about a few pennies. Um, but those pennies add up because we drink a lot and this, it, it raises about $50 million a year for the state. But what many people have overlooked is the fact that the taxes really are also a tool of public policy because they affect the price of the alcohol that's sold. And um, it's pretty clear that when the state imposes a tax on these items, the distributors or wholesalers pass that tax on the consumers. And so it artificially makes the substance a little bit more expensive. And this is important because the basic economic principles of supply and demand say that when you raise taxes a little bit, you reduce demand some. And in this case, you particularly rate, uh, reduce demand by young people who don't have necessarily as much access to cash and people that are really exposed to the price increases because they're consuming a lot of alcohol. And so uh, the research has gone on over many years and in many states. And on my read of it all, it seemed pretty definitive that when you raise alcohol taxes, there's a reduction in, in consumption and that you see a lot of reductions in the harms that alcohol can have. You see reductions in DWI. You see reductions in, in cirrhosis, some of the chronic conditions associated with alcohol. Um, so, you know, we know that this policy measure is effective. We see uh, lawmakers really neglecting it, though. It, over the last 30 years, not only have we left alcohol taxes at their same rate, we've allowed inflation to eat away at them because yeah. we, we tax alcohol. This is kind of subtle, but we tax alcohol by the volume that is sold, not by its price. Mm -hmm. So that means... A $6 pack of Budweiser 20 years ago has the same tax on it as a $12 pack of Budweiser has today. So uh, all told, you know, we're kind of turning our back on one of the most important measures to addressing excessive alcohol use. Um, and that's not only true in New Mexico, that's true across the country. Mm -hmm. Representative, Absolutely. please, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, that's all true, and uh, especially to prevent underage drinking, um, because if the younger you are when you start to drink, the more likely you are to become uh, an, a lifelong abuser of alcohol and see those effects. In 2017, um, we had a group that was trying to um, address that and raise the tax, I think it was a quarter a drink. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to kind of change that a little bit and come back to trying to make it a percentage so that we don't have to um, have inflation or different things change the effectiveness of raising uh, the tax mm -hmm. and the deterrent effect that it has. 